The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or KSQD's staff, volunteers, or underwriters. You're tuned in to Tackling the Taboo Sunday Dinner on 90.7 K-Squid. This is your host, DJ Dupsey. This is our premiere episode, and Sunday Dinner aims to feature a variety of voices in the Monterey Bay area, particularly BIPOC voices, queer and trans voices, voices of women, and voices of people who have been underrepresented or pushed to the margins of our community, society, or what we could call mainstream history. Now, you may be wondering, if the title of the show is Sunday Dinner, then who all has a seat at the table? And to that, I would say, what we aim to do with this show is to take it beyond the literal and proverbial table to bring the conversations to where we are, where we live. So Sunday dinner doesn't always have to happen at a table. It can happen on a beach, in a forest, in a park, at a corner cafe, in the street. And so really taking the concept of Sunday dinner and broadening it outside of the proverbial and literal four-sided table. Several themes that will be central to Sunday dinner include intersectionality. All of those identity groups and communities I just listed earlier, they don't function in a silo or independently of one another. All of our social, spiritual, and political stuff, it's all connected, and we're all connected. Storytelling will be another central theme. Reconnecting to ancestral narratives, telling stories from all perspectives, multiple perspectives, engaging with the meta-narratives, the stories within the stories, stories about the nature of our existence, space, and time, and healing, healing the intergenerational trauma, talking about the medicine, talking about our responsibility, talking about dream space and rest. Joining us on this pilot episode for our first flight will be Georgia Ilono and Alexis Rodriguez. Georgia is the lead intern with the Roots of Traditional Foods and Cultural Practices program at UC Santa Cruz, a program that aims to connect land-based education with mental health and wellness for Black folks, Indigenous folks, and people of color. Alexis is going to talk to us about their work at the Seymour Marine Biology Center and the Earth Day themed drag show they hosted recently. Under My Voice is the song Boat Cruise by Thundercat, and this is from the album The Golden Age of Apocalypse. Once again, I'm DJ Dupsey. And you're listening to Tackling the Taboo Sunday Dinner on 90.7 K-Squid. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the Sunday Dinner. Um, This is our first episode, um, so thank you for joining us. I'm DJ Dupsey, um, and joining me today in the studio um, are my guests, uh, my friends, uh, community members, uh, Georgia and Alexis. So um, we'll start uh, maybe with our appetizer, uh, uh, so to speak. Um, We'll just have our two guests introduce themselves, and we'll get into uh, why they're here today and what they're here to share with us. Um, So Georgia, why don't you just uh, give us a brief intro about who you are and what brings you um, to this area? Thank you, Mark. Hi, everyone. My name is Georgia Iluno. I'm a fourth year legal studies major and a black studies minor at UC Santa Cruz. Um, it is my last year, so I'm studying to become a lawyer within the next couple years. Great, great. Uh, and Alexis, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and what brings you to the area? 
Hi, my name is Alexis Rodriguez, and I am a fifth year student at UCSC. I am currently pursuing a double major in biochemistry and molecular biology and marine sciences, and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. So we'll start uh, with, with Georgia. Um, so I understand that you are the lead intern with the Roots of Traditional Foods and Cultural Practices program, which is a program um, on UCSC campus, which aims to connect land-based education and mental health and wellness for BIPOC and uh, identified folks. And so to start off, could you tell us a bit more about the Roots program and why you sought out this opportunity? Yeah, so um, like you mentioned before, Roots connects um, BIPOC men mental health. And for those that do not know the acronym BIPOC, we serve um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color on campus. And we connect mental health with land education to help students understand different ways to heal from generational traumas or heal from the stress of society or just heal from other, other mental health issues as well. We also learn about different ways um, how our exposure to plants and nature can help us take a step back from being overwhelmed and better ground ourselves with the gratitude of the land. Um, and we also learn about community building, storytelling, and other decolonization practices that help us appreciate the land in a greater way. Yeah, so when you saw this opportunity, say, for example, I guess maybe in an email or on a bulletin board, um, you know, apply for this Roots program. Um, what made you initially apply? Um, yeah, just based on what, what you knew about it at the time. Yeah, um, well, when I first seen it, it was something new that um, a new program that I've never seen before at UCSC, which is what sparked my interest to apply. Um, considering it's my last year, I always want to, you know, expand my horizons at UCSC and engage in practices that I had never done before. Um, growing up, I never was really into farm work, or maybe I just never really understood the importance of being connected to the land. And I feel like Roots was a perfect way to help me learn about that and also, you know, connect it to my ancestors and also learn more about my culture and how they utilize plants to, you know, better heal and, you know, connect more to their community. And um, community building is like really big for me. Um, I just think about, you know, historically, you know, African Americans were meant to be separated, mm -hmm. especially at a university, <clears throat> excuse me, especially at a university where, you know, I often felt isolated, mm -hmm. you know, many times when I came to UC Santa Cruz. And, you know, whenever there's programs that kind of encourage that, it um, kind of it influences me to get involved and see what it's about and also, you know, reach out to my other community members so, you know, they can not feel that sense of isolation. And also, um, land education is a good part to incorporate, you know, community building and um, the whole grounding experience as well. And it's just something that I want to experience in addition to, you know, let my other community members know about it too as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so many good things come up, um, but I definitely want to get to um, what kinds of topics you all have been discussing in the Roots space, because um, I understand that um, there's a regular meeting on Wednesdays, and then you have um, a hands in the earth uh, praxis day, if you will, mm -hmm. on Fridays. And so, um, yeah, if you could share with us what kind of topics you all have been discussing in those Roots spaces and what has been meaningful to you um, in these curricular and praxis spaces. Yeah, so... Um we cover a lot of different things at Roots. Um, initially, we talk about different opportunities to help us get involved in the community and show up to each other's events. Communi um, events based on like identity consciousness or maybe just farmland work. Um, of course, we had, we had farm days bi-weekly. We visit the Black Lives Matter Garden on campus and also the College 9 Gerald Garden as well. And that kind of helps us, you know, and that honestly, visiting the farm is my favorite part about Roots because, um, you know, like I said before, it is not something that I appreciated. So because, you know, I just immersed myself in it, you know, amongst the Roots, other Roots interns, I started to find like the joy in taking care of the farm, taking care of a place that, you know, we benefit a lot from. And um, it, it brings me joy, you know, when I, you know, even just something as little as de-weeding or learning about the way plants grow, why they grow. And um, that brings me a lot of comfort, just knowing that, you know, we walk on this grass, we use these plants, so why not 
appreciate taking care of them. Um, and also we talk a lot about, you know, land back topics. Like we had a, we had a, um, a event where some indigenous people talked about land back appreciation and how we can better um, appreciate the land that we benefit from mm -hmm. and how we can also transform the educational system to kind of um, indoctrinate, indoctrinate the perspectives um, and also just being intentional about land use because, um, you know, when I think about environmental conservation initially, I just think about, you know, um, just taking care of plants, period, but it's also kind of the education part too, like being appreciative and taking your time out to learn about the land as well. We talked a lot about, you know, the concept of work too, which was um, really interesting to me. Um, you know, the main um, crux of the concept of work is to think of work because we want to do it, not because of the wage. And, um, you know, of course that definitely um, connects to taking care of the land. You know, think about taking care of the land because you want to, you know, um, you appreciate it, not just because, you know, it's just something that, you know, you reap ben benefits from or like any financial gain from. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, I also think about like the concept of work as like it relates to being a student at UCSC, you know, um, work or school work or any type of work that you conduct at school it can be it can be less meaningful you know when professors may show lack of appreciation mm -hmm. or lack of care um but like when work is more intentional like when we know why we're doing the work how it's going to benefit us in the future um we're not so much um i guess like um we're not harmed if we do something bad or if we get a bad grade you know we kind of it's better if we learn from our mistakes than just think about the grade think about you know what does it mean to do school work rather than just to get a good grade um and i think that will make us more um inclined to engage in work that's more meaningful um yeah and then we also talked a lot about um how like um abolishing work to like um, allocating energy towards meaningful parts of our life because um, a lot of times we spend so much time working nine to fives and we lose time with our friends and family mm -hmm. and we get so normalized to that and don't realize you know that is something that really benefits our mental health that actually helps us come to work when we have things around us that makes us happy but when we spend t too many times or too much of our time at a job where we don't really get rewarded as we should be. We may not put as much thought into it. And, you know, there could be different forms of work. You know, taking care of your mental health can be a form of work, but that's not something that in society we're rewarded from. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things that I'll end with that we talk about in Roots is um, elements. Um, we talk a lot about how, you know, the different elements, you know, connect to land conservation and land appreciation, like water, fire, air and earth and um there's some times in roots where we talk about you know which element do you connect the most to and why mm -hmm. and this may seem like a simple question but you know it kind of helps us get connected to each other more because um we did this exercise with all the interns and staff and we each had our own element that we identified with which kind of helped help us um understand each other more like for me um i chose water just because you know um, when I changed my diet to become a vegan, I started being more conscious about what I eat and what I put in my body. And I learned that, like, you know, water is not only something that you drink, but it is nourishment. And I find that, you know, when I drink it, I feel more energy, you know, more um, will to do a lot of things. And, you know, it's just something that is always going to be there. And um, I also connect to it more just because whenever I feel stressed or overwhelmed, I go to the beach mm -hmm. and I really like the sound of water. It brings me joy. It brings me comfort. You know, the ocean is calming, you know, and um, I'm also very um, religious. So I just think about when you appreciate the things that God made, it just makes me feel more grateful about life and grateful just to be here, period. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I encourage others to do just element activities. Just think about what part of the land that, you feel most comfort in and it's just a type of reflection piece that really helps at roots 
If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Tackling the Taboo Sunday Dinner. This is DJ Dupsey. You're listening on 90.7 K-Squid. All right. Thank you, Georgia, Mm -hmm. for um, those amazing insights and definitely some things I want to circle back to. Uh, And I want to bring Alexis in. Um, So, Alexis, um, you work at the Seymour Marine uh, Discovery Center. Um, Could you tell us a bit about the Seymour Center just in general? Yeah, so um, the Seymour Center is a marine education center slash visitor um, experience uh, center that is located at the Coastal Science uh, Campus at UCSC. Um, Visitors can explore touch tanks, live animals, um, and it focuses a lot about the natural rich environment of the Monterey Bay. You get to learn about conservation efforts that are happening um, at UCSC. Awesome, awesome. So now... I understand you had the idea of having a drag show at the Seymour Center, not just having a drag show at the Seymour Center, but particularly on Earth Day, correct? So what inspired you to want to bring those two elements together? And what do you feel the impact is of inviting queer and trans students to Marine Biology Center um, to learn about the importance of ocean health while also participating in this, uh, I guess you could say, quote unquote, traditional queer experience? Yeah, definitely. Um, combining a drag show with Earth Day may seem a little bit unconventional, but it was uh, powerful. It was a powerful way to bring attention to the intersectionality of issues that affect our planet and our communities. Um, the drag community has a long history of activism and inviting queer and trans students to a marine biology center such as the Seymour Center. Um, we can create an inclusive and diverse learning environment. Um, and uh, many uh, LGBTQ plus individuals struggle with social isolation mm. and discrimination, particularly in the STEM fields, um, where they're often underrepresented and undervalued. So I thought of um, by creating this like welcoming and inclusive environment for these queer and trans students um, at these marine biology centers that their interest um, in STEM and other activities could like flourish. Awesome. Awesome. Um, So um, this amazing drag show happened right on Saturday, April 22nd. Um, So unfortunately, folks, if you're listening, this already happened. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, If you if you're listening, thinking like, oh, that sounds really cool. I want to go to that. Um, Unfortunately, it happened on Earth Day, uh, uh, Saturday, April 22nd. Um, So catch us same time, you know, next year. Um, But Alexis, how would you describe the energy in the center that night? Um, how did the audience experience the space? Um, what what happened? Do you think that made it special? Oh my God, the energy in the room was intense. It was so um, electric. It was very um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was it was just amazing. Like there's no words that I can use to describe it. You just had to be there, um, and it was so great seeing all these different backgrounds all these different individuals that were coming all for the same goal of not only like loving and caring for our planet but for the yearning of needing spaces like this you know and i just like you mentioned hopefully this is something that happens every year um we are in the talks of like talking about how we might be able to broaden it so that it doesn't focus just on like ucsc students but also like the community of santa cruz and maybe like expanding it so that we have more space so that we can cater to more people Um, because we hosted it in the La Feliz room, which is the area where we have a lot of our events. And the capacity for that room is 200. And we had over 300 people trying to cram up into this space. No way. Yeah. No, we did. Yeah, we did, which I thought was incredible, because honestly, in my mind, I thought we were going to have at most 40 to 50 people. But when that ended up happening, when um, because originally we had like an event by page to kind of keep tabs on how many people wanted to come. And it like booked within like the week. So definitely in the talks of maybe having it in the parking lot so we can have like different stages, kind of give it like a concert vibe where you have like different stages where like you get to pick where you want to go. Or even like a music festival vibe. Almost. Yeah, like a music festival vibe. Awesome. All right. Well, I definitely want to hear more about that. Um, but I want to pivot back to Georgia um, to get back into the roots. Um, so... Um, Roots aims to, um, like I mentioned, right, have these uh, praxis days, hands in the earth days, right, um, about every other week, um, as well as uh, hosting public spaces for folks to engage with this work of land education. And so um, why do you think this praxis and community engagement element is important to the Roots program? I definitely think it is 
really important to the community building aspect. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, coming to UCSC, I did feel a lot of feelings of, you know, isolation and it did take a toll on my mental health. And it was very difficult to find, you know, different ways to kind of deal with how can I ground myself at this university? You know, there's so many resources, but, you know, where, where can I look? And I feel like Roots provides kind of like a unique space, you know, with, you know, the farm work that we do every week. Um, you know, that is vital, you know, different environment where students like me can kind of um, better utilize, you know, the plants and the nature to um, connect to connect to something that, you know, is central to them mm -hmm. and, you know, not something that can be taken away. Um, and I feel like um, it's another way to kind of show gratitude to yourself, you know, even though you're taking care of a land that maybe we did not create it is something that we benefit from and we share from you know we share fruit and bear fruit from and I see like you know even when I do the farm work with my interns like I it seems like a sense like I'm thanking myself I'm showing mm -hmm. love to myself by taking this time out to care for myself wow. and um also you know taking care of a land that you know, my ancestors work so hard from in, which is often ignored many, many times. Um, and one last thing, um, mm -hmm. I do have a large connection to lavender mm -hmm. and um, I never really understood, like, honestly, like roots really made me understood lavender more than I ever thought I could understood it because mm -hmm. it's just a smell that I always kept in my room. I always bought, you know, lavender essential oils because it's just something that it just calms me it helps me sleep just like um you know the smell just does something to me and you know when we talk a lot about elements and we visit the farm a lot you know i see a lot of lavender and you know when i learn about the growth i learn about where it came from it makes me more appreciative of, of it and it wants um and it makes me want to include it more in like different parts of my life not just you know having the oil but mm -hmm. you know normally should recommended that I keep a little plant of lavender with me and you know that that also makes me appreciate myself more you know taking that time out to care for myself because you know the land is for us so we should utilize any other way to incorporate it in our lives um mm -hmm. yeah. yeah thank you for that Georgia Again, if you're just tuning in to 90.7 K Squid, I am DJ Dupsey, and you're listening to Tackling the Taboo Sunday Dinner. We're here with my friends, uh, Georgia and Alexis. And Georgia, you're sharing with us about uh, your experience with the roots of traditional foods and cultural practices internship program. And one thing I just want to circle back to real quick is you mentioned um, the joy um, that you feel um, when you're um, either in the curricular space or in the garden space, but particularly in the garden garden space. Um, and so given that one of the goals of Roots is to connect land education with mental health or wellness, um, could you speak a little bit about that joy um, and where you feel that comes from and why you feel that's important to tap into um, in this in this time, in this space? Yeah, um, I definitely feel like I feel joy when I, you know, reach the farm just because I just feel like it's, you know, it's a part of our lives that you know, is constantly ignored or just not acknowledged. And and I think just for me personally, because it's something that I never really engaged in, something that I feared. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I finally, you know, discovered the beauty in it and how much it could bring so many community members together. Mm -hmm. Because when we do work on the farm, like, it's not just us. Like, you know, it's other people that work on the farm where, you know, other classes and other students that, you know, share this joy of taking care of the earth and, you know, the land that we constantly um, reap benefits from. So it's just also just being around that same type of energy um, that, um, you know, wants to share the joy of, you know, um, I guess taking care of the plants and also taking care of ourselves as well. And I just feel like the farm is a place where, um, there's no stress mm -hmm. or there's no assignments. There's no like arguments. There's no yelling. You know, mm -hmm. the only thing that you probably hear is the weeds or the grass. 
and you know for me that is what brings me peace when there's no distractions um and we're all focused on one thing and you know that thing is just to improve ourselves while also you know thanking ourselves and thanking the land for you know what it has done for us because you know ucsc is on a bunch of nature it is on a bunch of plants you know Mm -hmm. um when some of the curriculum in roots talks about how you know before things were built inside a forest you know there was a variety of different animals that used to Mm -hmm. like roam like bunnies and animals that Mm -hmm. we don't even see anymore but because we have like contaminated the land so much we don't see the beauty in it as much anymore but um i feel like roots reminds us that you know we can still you know it's still there and we could still replenish it by putting our hands in it you know like our ancestors used to do and you know maybe that time will come like maybe the animals will show their faces again you Mm -hmm. know maybe we'll discover things that we've never have you know that nature could provide from us um and i just also think about you know when i learned about um you know how um, our ancestors like a lot of times um hunting was very expensive so they utilize like um i guess medicine purposes and food purposes all solely on plants like they survive Mm -hmm. solely on plants and they survive for a very long time and it wasn't until we added all these other things where we kind of forgot about that and i do want to connect to that because you know plants are something that will always be there you know nature is something that will always be there animals will always be there too but you know in my opinion you know we can appreciate them you know from a distance and kind of re relearn the ways that um we could benefit things that you know land education is free like you know and it should be common knowledge we should know where things come from like from the roots and um i think i know that's just something that i feel like is what i needed in my lives and we needed in my life and um it just brings me joy to know that other people are on the same page mm-hmm. thank you for that georgia yeah um so alexis i'm going to come back to you um again and uh, going back to the earth day drag show um on saturday april 22nd um What do you think a night like that um, means in the light of national conversations and emerging legislation targeting um, at oppressing the queer and trans community and literally suppressing drag show performances? Um, What do you think a night like this bringing together these two elements of of Earth Day and drag? um, What do you think it means in, in the light of all these conversations and legislations? Yeah, I definitely think that it's something extremely important um, to be able to create these safe space for trans and um, queer youth, but the queer community and trans community in general. Um, you know, it's definitely a beacon of hope and it lets um, individuals know that, you know, there's resistance happening for a lot of these legislations that are ongoing that are, you know, trying to take away these basic rights to uh, queer and uh, trans individuals. Um, and, oh, sorry, I got distracted. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely extremely important. Um, you know, as drag, drag has been coming, becoming very mainstream with things like RuPaul's Drag Race, you know, uh, we have drag queens appearing in things like the Met Gala, you know, they're appearing in musicals, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, on Broadway and things like that. So because they've become such, uh, uh, like I want not overnight sensation, but because they're having so much time, you know, in like uh, social media and like you know on like these platforms, they're obviously becoming a target for yeah. like these like legislative actions. Um, and unfortunately, it's something that pains me and it hurts me to see all um, these like regulations that are happening that are not only targeting like the people in my community, but also myself as well. Mm. Um, you know, as someone who is queer um, and identifies as non-binary and, you know, wants to pursue something in drag, it's definitely mm-hmm. scary to know that you're not welcomed in a lot of these uh, places. Mm-hmm. And it's nice to know that the Seymour Center um, was able to open its doors and be able to create this, like, amazing sense of, like, uh, belonging and, like, community, um, even if it was just for a night. And like we said, hopefully this becomes a yearly thing and, like, mm-hmm. the legacy of the Earth Day Drag Ball April 22nd lives on. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and yeah, no. still talking about it. 
yeah, no, folks are still definitely talking about it. Um, and it's it's definitely really, really heartwarming to hear like all the stories that I've been hearing about the experiences that people had during that day. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a night to remember. Yeah. One experience, right, was that a couple of our scheduled performers, um, and I say our because transparency, folks, uh, yours truly, DJ Dubsy, was the host um, of the Earth Day Drag Show. Um, so uh, I can, I'm speaking uh, from this from the inside uh, perspective. A couple of our performers scheduled didn't show up that night. Um, so we decided to open it up to the audience for an impromptu drag karaoke style um, kind of situation. And so what do you feel that this added to the night? Night, um, and do you think the audience participation should be a staple part of the event moving forward? Yeah, no, it it was definitely uh, a curveball when a lot of our performers didn't show up, um, and it definitely put into perspective that you know we were we were still um, this was like a we were a very young event happening. It was our first time, and you know, like when we did our debriefing, we went over like some things that we can do to better prepare for situations like that. Um, but definitely opening it up for the audience, it was definitely a surprise factor where we weren't really expecting it. We didn't know how it was going to go. Um, it could have gone either horribly well or horribly wrong. And thankfully, thankfully, it went really well. Um, everybody really enjoyed it. We had a bunch of different performers that went up. They were just doing their own numbers. Um, and it was it was nice to see all the different backgrounds and all the different like stories that were being told and like the performances that they were doing. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, definitely um, unexpected, but definitely added that wow factor to it. Um, and it made it a little bit more intimate, you know, because when you have performers that you don't really know, um, you're there, you're having fun. But when you see your own friends or your own like partners or your own like family members even performing, it definitely adds that that um, intimacy factor. And I definitely think that this is something that should continue on in the next drag events that we have. Um, probably a little bit more better managed because unfortunately, um, because we were time constrained, we did have to turn a couple people away, which breaks my heart. But um, the fact that we had that. Um, there was so much excitement. Yeah, there was so much excitement. People really wanted to perform. And the fact that that like wanting was there, it puts it into perspective, like how much we really need these spaces and how much we really, really need events like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was beautiful to see the students from campus and then also folks from the community um, all be there together, right? And, and bringing those two communities together because often, yeah, it can be hard given that UCSC is, you know, up on the hill, you know, and so, it, you know, it can be very difficult sometimes. And so um, it was it was great that, that we got to bring those folks together for that night. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially, you know, since UCSC is like a, a, a community of students, you know, that aren't really from UCSC, you know, they're from different areas throughout like either this, uh, the state or like the country, even around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it's nice to be able to create that space for the students at UCSC, but also hopefully in the future, we can also open it to the community because realistically speaking, the students at UCSC are also part of the community of Santa Cruz, exactly. even though we, yes. ten we tend to like put ourselves into these little like separate spaces. But I think moving forward, we definitely have to unite ourselves and say, you know what, we are, we are Santa Cruz, we are UCSC, we are the Seymour Center, you know, mm -hmm. um, because isolating ourselves, I mean, you, you can't put yourself into separate categories and try to like, um, yeah, I mean, when you think about build it, community. Yeah, yeah, you have you to build, be, yeah. yeah, you have to build a community when you think about it, um, reg like, you know, tying it back to Earth Day, you know, we're, we're definitely trying to let people know that regardless of your background, regardless of your sexual orientation, of your gender identity, we all have to come together, you know, to protect this beautiful place we call our home, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of like your religious views, your political views or whatever, like at the end of the day, we need to remove that aside and focus on what's really important, which is like preserving the beauty of nature, you know? Exactly. You know, I, I like to think that all the time we spend arguing if we don't have a planet and environment to argue in what are all the arguments worth exactly. um, so uh, thank you for those insights and perspectives Alexis uh, Georgia one more question for you um, so how would you connect what you're experiencing in the roots program to your overall experience of being a student um, at UCSC um, at this point in time and space yeah so um, Roots was one of the you know, many community organizations that I was involved in, or well, student based that I was involved in at UCSC. Um, I've been um, a Black Academy mentor. Um, I was a MOJA coordinator. MOJA was the 
a retention program for the African, Black, and Caribbean students on campus. And I created a lot of um, events and programming that contributed to their retention and to, um, you know, that their academic excellence and, you know, their social excellence and financial aid as well. And um, I really enjoyed being involved in programs that encourage BIPOC representation and retention at UCSC because um, I didn't realize how important it was, you know, till it happened to me. Hmm. And, you know, it was very, it was very tantamount and like significant for me to constantly pursue an education at UCSC to have a community and to have um, someone or something that I can relate with. And, you know, it just became like almost addicting to just always gravitate towards these type of opportunities that improve, you know, um, BIPOC and specifically for my identity, you know, African-American mental health, um, just because, you know, there's not a lot of us at UCSC and that does bother me a lot and it does um always like permeate my mind why it doesn't bother you know administration but um you know that is you know i guess it's up to students and student-based organizations to kind of fix that problem and you know use our own experiences to help others um and like you know like i said like it's my fourth year at ucsc and you know being a student and being a student leader um, and also identifying like as an African-American woman, I've had like experience, you know, lots of pushback from administrators and, you know, professors just because, you know, um, I feel like my treatment it differs from, you know, the general student population. And, you know, there's been a lot of times where, you know, I had to kind of, you know, report professors for the way that you know, they have spoken to me or they have treated my organizations, you know, a lot of per, a lot of administrations have told me that, you know, some of my events aren't that important, you mm-hmm. know, that improve the retention of African-Americans, you know, but that is what pushes me, you know, to keep doing this work because, you know, I'm trying to um, really directly come up with a solution to an ongoing problem. Mm-hmm. And um, as students, unfortunately, it's really up to us to do that. And, you know, the programs like Roots and, you know, the other student led programs that I engage in um, really enforce that, you know, these spaces, it seem to not be created for BIPOC students historically and systemically. And when students continue to engage in these programs, um, we occupy the space, we occupy, you know, spaces to encourage other students to, you know, um, I guess, resist, you know, all the pushback or all the things that they make them feel isolated or make them feel unwanted. And um, Ruth specifically, you know, amongst all these things, you know, we, I often forget about my mental health and I feel like a lot of students may do as well. You know, student leaders, we, you know, deal with a lot of, you know, different factors when it comes to organizing, you know, from administration, from students and taking care of other people, you forget to take care of yourself. And Roots was like kind of the first program that I engaged in that really reminded me that, you know, that's kind of the most important thing that, you know, we should focus in our lives because that helps us put more energy into things to help others, you know, things that I actually genuinely want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And Roots taught me like to, use land education to use self-care as something valuable in my life that you know I want to keep doing and um you know Roots taught me like how to use land as resource you know that also helps me improve my confidence you know it's something new that I've learned that I could share with others and something new that I could really feel confident in you know um influencing others to do and um you know Roots also talked Roots also taught me to, you know, to take time out of, you know, grounding myself out um, away from all the, um, uh, the, I'm sorry. Busyness. Yeah, all the busyness and like all the practices that the university kind of pushes us against the wall to, you know, not, not really want to be a confident or a successful student leader, but you know, Roots gave me access to like an education that I feel like was never really shared with me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we always talk about like hidden curriculum, but, you know, why does hidden curriculum even exist? And, you know, I feel like 
roots is something that we should all know and it shouldn't just be a program maybe it should just be a class or a required you know a required course to take you know students should be able to BIPOC students especially should be able to find out different ways to take care of themselves because you know this is a program that I look forward to every week because it does make me feel really good you know to learn about something that I've you know never really dabbled in until being a lead intern and you know there's different ways we're just taught me like there's different ways to seek knowledge to seek refuge to seek self-care like maybe it's not just your counselor maybe it's just going outside you know or maybe it's just learning about the land more um and yeah thank you for the yeah. opportunity <laughs> yeah yeah thank you georgia and and thank you alexis um for sharing about your experiences um so um we actually have today on Sunday dinner, we'll have um, a surprise uh, seconds. We'll have some seconds. Um, some some friends of mine um, came to join me from uh, the Black Men's Initiative, um, as well as um, the farm and SUA. So um, if you're just tuning in, I'm DJ Dupsey. Uh, you're listening to the Tackling the Taboo Sunday Dinner on 90.7 K-Squid. <laughs>
Welcome, welcome back to Tackling the Taboo Sunday Dinner. This is DJ Dupsey on 90.7 K Squid. So we have a special treat for you tonight. We have a second helping, a second portion. Um, so some surprise guests that I'm so grateful um, join me today. And so I'm going to have them introduce themselves real quick, and then we'll get into some discussion. So let's start with you, Ariel. Hello, Squid community. My name is Ariel Silva, or you can call me Ariel. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm a second year critical race and ethnic studies major, also minoring in black studies. I'm coming to you all as a community organizer here on campus, and I'm in spaces such as the Black Student Union, Sanai, which is our indigenous org here on campus. Oh, we're not here on campus, but my, my, my voice is carrying on to campus right now. Sanai, I work with the Cultural Arts and Diversity Center in Rainbow Theater as an outreach coordinator. I also work in the co-curricular activities office of College 9 and John R. Lewis and also a few other spaces as well as being steward of the Black Lives Matter Garden, which I'm going to be discussing with you all today. So I'm honored to be in this space and I'll hand it off to the other folks I'm in the show with today. Yeah, this is Dion. I'm a fourth year marine bio major. I'm the BMI mentor, Black Men's Initiative, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Dub C. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. And um, my name is Corbin, and I'm a third year film and digital media major, pronouns um, he, they. Uh, I'm also a BMI uh, mentor for Black Men's Initiative. All right, thank you all for being here. So we'll start with you, Ariel, um, and the Black Lives Matter Garden. I understand you're the CUIP intern. Um, and so what inspired you to get involved with the Black Lives Matter Garden, and what has that involvement meant to you thus far? So for folks that don't know what CUIP is, that's the Chancellor's University Internship Program here on campus and where many offices or many orgs um, have interns that get paid through a year-long program and it teaches us skills to be adaptable, versatile in many aspects. And my particular internship this year is in the Black Lives Matter Garden on that's located in the Calf's Farm. And what inspired me to get involved with the BLM Garden was seeing the work that was done in it last year. I've always been connected to the land as I have Afro-Indigenous roots. And so I wanted to make sure I still carried on that connection and fortunately applied for the position and got it. I still right. think I'd be involved with the BLM Garden regardless, yeah, going yeah. to work days and involving myself in the land, though I was drawn to the position and I've been honored to serve as a steward this year so the show wouldn't be tackling the taboo if we didn't tackle a little taboo so i understand mm -hmm. there were some recent layoffs at the farm right i'm um, on ucsc's campus um can you tell me a bit about how these layoffs have impacted the dynamic at the farm so it has been such an exhausting and such a laborious time for folks on the farm. Mm. Um, so for folks that don't know, there's sometimes what's called, in quotation marks, a reconstruction that's done to certain offices, done to certain programs, or done to complete entities on campuses, and in which they'll probably try to do a rebrand and try to say like, oh, this, this new place is gonna get a nice and shiny look, and that also means that they're going to be firing some staff maybe reworking some positions and putting more labor on other folks. And that's exactly what happened mm. on the Cass farm. Um, so my two mentors of the Black Lives Matter Garden, Kelly and Alex, were fired, mm. were let go uh, very spontaneously. And so we had to do a year's worth of work, essentially, in uh, like half of a quarter. Wow. And so we had to work really hard to do like some background information because those are the last two folks that existed on campus that know the extensive history of the Black Lives Matter Garden, of all the liberation work that's been done in the space, of the collectives, individuals, and stewards that have worked there to keep it alive mm -hmm. because the Black Lives Matter Garden exists out of resistance. It r exists to be there for um, BIPOC students to be a place where we can mourn, we can experience our sadness with one another, we can 
be in community with one another while also experiencing joy, mm -hmm. laughter, happiness, and come together in a space that's meant for us and that was built for us mm -hmm. by students that were also struggling, right? It's a direct, direct resistance to what the institution of the UCs does in totality. And so um, it's been really taxing on my body, both mentally, physically, and spiritually, mm -hmm. that I had the two people that cared for the space the most and also cared for me on this campus and cared for all of the African, Black, Caribbean students, all the Latinx students, all the indigenous students and queer students on, the, mm -hmm. on campus to be stripped from me and to have that like, now I'm carrying on next year because thankfully I'm staying on as another steward all right, all next right. year that I'm going to have to take more of like a mentorship role in carrying this history with me in which I wasn't expecting. Maybe a little sooner than you thought. A little sooner than I thought I would. <laughs> and so it's, disheartening that we've had to fight and like um there's a beautiful event coming up this week talking about anti-colonial land stewardship and working with um the center for racial justice and having this open conversation of the effects that this had on campus and on students like me student workers workers that are on the farm and that like we we're doing double the work or mm -hmm. like more more than our bodies can handle the wow. farm is overgrown like our cover crop this season because mm -hmm. of the rain was monumentous mm -hmm. um, and cover crop for folks that don't know um, system that was uh, done by so-called the peanut man George Washington Carver mm -hmm. uh, designed cover crop to um, pull nitrate out of the soil and so it's also a way that you can combat weeds and there was so much cover crop and not enough people because mm. they decided to lay off not only two staff that worked in the BLM garden, but also other staffs, so about five people in total. Wow. total. Wow. Mm. And that those, the rest of the staff that's left on the farm are having to take on their jobs, in which it's not enough jobs for just a handful of people to do. Right. It was done by double those people. And I also think it goes to show like my mentors weren't equitably paid they didn't have mm. enough resources to work with and i think it's telling because most of the bipoc staff that worked on the farm are the ones that got laid off wow. and so it's so tiring i've been put in another space that i have to exist in that fighting actively and like one of the consequences of losing my mentors is i was cut off from my budget mm. i've had no access to my financial analyst i've had to fight and fight to barely get like 300 dollars with the po's for this quarter alone and to fight to keep me on for another year just because i'm harboring so much more knowledge that if it's lost with me, it could be lost for generations and that can't happen in the space, right? We yeah. have so much that's written and so much that's told orally and that once the removal of certain individuals happens, uh, cultures are at risk of being lost. Right. Like spaces that house people safely for our humanity to exist on this campus can, can, be, can be stripped away from us. And so that's what I'm trying to combat. And that's what a lot of communities stepped in. Like Georgia mentioned, Norma Alicia, she's mm -hmm. one of the folks that's been helping fight for the space. Linnea Beckett, who mm -hmm. works with Praxis, another um, a beautiful org on campus, also a teacher. Um, I've been he heavily helping me in this process of fighting for the space and lots of community organizers, teachers, staffs, mm -hmm. students have come in and try to support the garden and its mission and to keep it and like also know what it means to like break down the systems of, you know, should even the BLM garden exist in the cast farm? Mm -hmm. What do we get? What if we make our own farm? What mm -hmm. if that happens? What, what will they do without us, right? Mm -hmm. And so just some of those some of those things always floating around that's, yeah, just, that's yeah. what this this year's been like <laughs> all right um so so dion and corbin i want to pivot to you all right and in, in connecting right the what what rl's been bringing up about the importance of a black lives matter garden space for example but also the importance of mentorship um that that Ariel was just talking about right you all serve as mentors within the black men's initiative so could you tell us a bit about um the black men's initiative and what inspired you all to get involved as mentors so I'll start out and speak on my inspiration to be a part of it. So when I came as a first year, I was a part of the, the mentees, right? And coming in as a freshman, I didn't know really anything about the campus. I just knew that, you know, it looked nice, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to get in touch with anybody, especially my, you know, my culture and my, you know, my people mm -hmm. as, you know, black people in just b being a part of the program really, it gave me a sense of purpose, a sense of 
belonging on the campus, mm-hmm. being in touch with everybody, a part of it that year, then I wanted to give back mm-hmm. in a sense and be the mentor. So as a mentor, basically we, you know, we meet with our set mentees every week, right? And mm-hmm. and we just talk about how they're doing and give them little bits of advice with for anything they're going through and just be there for them. That's essentially what we're what we serve as we're just people to talk to if they have any troubles, right? And then we have different uh, purposes in the program as well. So I, I'm personally the marketing league, mm-hmm. they're the marketing lead. And then we have a professional development, we have academic success, we have community engagement. So we were really, All right. yeah, we're really rounded All right. in you know, our purposes for the program. Pass it off to Yeah, um, for me, you know, I, I came in in 2020, and <clears throat> that that was uh, the pandemic year. So that first year, you know, the pivotal experience, being a freshman, not really getting to be on campus, not really getting to, you know, see anyone, let alone a black face. Mm-hmm. And, and that time, you know, is around 2.3% black population at the school. Um, you know, this year it just hit 5%. Wow. So the motivation for me to join you know, was to f- find these faces, mm-hmm. you know, if I can help the first year, you know, that got the opportunity, that's a plus in itself, but, you know, just getting, getting active and in, in this, you know, program, this cohort of men, you know, it's expanded beyond just, just the first years, you know, um, we get the first years, but then we've, we've got, you know, the transfers mm-hmm. who, you Ooh, know, technically yes. count as, you know, their first year on campus. And then, after that, you know, we've got like the alumni that come back. Right, so we've got, right. you know, these graduate graduate students. Um, we've got these fifth years. We've got second years. And so, you know, it's it's just really the, the engagement. And he's talking about uh, Dion. He's talking about, you know, the different roles. I'm the professional development role. So so my role, you know, engaging with with this space is making sure that, you know, each black man on the, on the campus that's in the cohort is, you know, developing professionally and understanding what they need to do um in a professional space but that the motivation that i had is is uh you know to build that community to make sure that it's not too taboo Mm -hmm. for every every face on the campus all right well i know uh you all are probably itching to hear more from from Ariel and from dion and from corbin um unfortunately we got to cut our sunday dinner um not short, but we just got to say, you know, farewell for, for now, right? And, and we'll bring it back again, uh, hopefully very soon. And so... Um, there's got to be dessert somewhere. There's got to be dessert, right? We always got to leave room for dessert, right? And so um, if you've been, been enjoying what, what Ariel and Dion and Corbin have been sharing thus far, um, you know, definitely listen in the future uh, for when we come back to the table for Sunday dinner. Once again, I'm DJ Dupsey. You've been listening to Tackling the Taboo Sunday Dinner on 90.7 K-Squid. Thank you so much much we definitely will have you back and invite all of you back and uh, certainly talk about the, the program should be back on the air and uh, maybe the individuals as well i hope and uh, thank you for a great pilot program thanks for having us 